Hey Matt, what are you doing interviewing a Jewish rabbi? Like, what on earth has he got to say? What can he possibly add to what we need to know? I'm actually more useful than Bill Gates or Donald Trump or Warren Buffett. Uh, for um, a very long period of time, more than hundreds of years, Jews have been disproportionately good with money. Your financial success is directly proportional to the number of friends you have. Actively increase the number of people who know you, like you, and trust you. The best way to build connection is through specialization. People assume money is material and not spiritual. Because God decided to give us something more important than equality, and that's freedom. Never short stopping, now I'm winning like I'm Jida. Steady through the rigor, yeah, I'm getting bigger. So my guest today is Rabbi Daniel Lappin, who's a respected Torah scholar, Jewish leader, radio and television personality, presidential advisor, and author. I actually stumbled across his interview watching an episode of The 700 Club, where he actually talked about the business secrets of the Bible. And uh, for those of you that watch the Seven Figure Squad YouTube channel, you have chosen these Sunday Seven Figure Scripture series as one of your favorite episodes of our content that we post online. So it is an honor and pleasure to have a conversation today with Rabbi Daniel Lappin. Rabbi, welcome to the Seven Fears Squad YouTube channel. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, I can't help saying that uh, the opportunity of being interviewed by a U.S. Marine was irresistible. <laughs> by the way, I understand that you just recently went through some COVID and health as well. Everything's good to go. Oh, You're thank God. All, all good. I used... I used um, the banned medication, hydroxychloroquine, and <laughs> you know, the one that uh, the government tells me doesn't work and doesn't do anything. Well, worked pretty darn well for me, I'll tell you. Goodness gracious. Uh, I have been venturing into your part of the country because we're actually building an office in the Tacoma, Washington area with inside the Polynesian oh, community. So it's been beautiful. Yes, yes. Wonderful. <laughs> I didn't realize how beautiful Seattle was. I it just you just feel clean. It just feels clean there with the uh, with the coastal air and uh, it's, uh, you know. It's, it, it's a lovely part of the country. It really is. But you you raised your you, you know um, just reading about you you raised your you raised and homeschooled your kids there in Mercer Island. I understand. That is right, which is an island in the middle of Lake Washington, and um, we uh, we did a lot of boating in the area. I sometimes say that uh, uh, it's possible that uh, there is no other bald-headed Jewish rabbi who knows the waters between Olympia and Campbell River better than I do. <laughs> I think you've often said in your interviews, you say that, uh, you know, uh, 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 being a rabbi is your faith, right? But being a, a sailor is your religion, <laughs> yeah, right? That's exactly right. <laughs> I've, had to, I've had to give a lot of explanations for having made that comment. <laughs> <laughs> Now, you have a website that says everybody needs a rabbi. Explain that because you have so many d different great ways. Uh, we'd love to hear it specifically from you. Well, it's, it's just this, Matt. Look, um, one of the legitimate questions I think that anybody could have is, hey, Matt, what are you doing interviewing a Jewish rabbi? Like, what on earth has he got to say? What can he possibly add to what we need to know? to build up our revenue, to be able to retire early, to be able to do all the things that we want to do. And uh, my answer is, well, I'm actually more useful than Bill Gates or Donald Trump or Warren Buffett. Boom. Because um, Bill Gates, you know, Bill Gates is really useful in terms of advice, provided you grew up on the cusp of the computer revolution, dropped out of Harvard, had a dad who's an international lawyer and a mom who was on the board of directors of IBM. Under those conditions, Bill Gates has a lot to teach. Correct. Uh, you know, Warren Buffett, yeah, if you got an IQ of about 200 and you started Berkshire Hathaway at the right point and you learned uh, from Graham how to be a value investor, yeah, Warren Buffett has something to tell you. And, you know, Donald Trump... Uh, I'm not saying it's uh, it's easy to make a huge fortune from a small fortune. Most people lose small fortunes and end up with nothing. But the fact is that his dad, Fred Trump, did leave him thousands of apartment units in Queens and Manhattan. 
Mm -hmm. They parlayed that in. But still, if if you're just an ordinary person whose father didn't leave you 16,000 apartment units, uh, then he's not very much used to you. I mean, entertaining, no question about it. Sure, sure. Uh, but, uh, but no, uh, I am more useful for the following reason. And that is that uh, for um, a very long period of time, more than hundreds of years, Jews have been disproportionately good with money. Correct. Now, this is not an anti-Semitic statement. It's not bigotry. It's just simple reality. And if it makes many of my fellow Jews uncomfortable when I say it, which it does, uh, suck it up, boys. I mean, that's all there is to it. So uh, it, it's a reality. And um, this is true in, in good and hospitable countries like the United States of America. And it's also been true in uh, tyrannical regimes that Jews mm -hmm. have lived in. And it's true today as it was true 300 years ago and 500 years ago today. And it's, it's been true not for one or two or three high IQ individuals or uh, people who inherit it. No, it's been true for a huge number of Jews uh, of, of every background and every shape and every gender and every color. Uh, Jews come in a variety and, and without exception. Now, it's not to say there are no poor Jews. Of course they are, but disproportionately. The number of Jews, the percentage of people of my faith uh, who do exceptionally well in business is stunning. It's, it's incontrovertible and it's quite shocking. And so um, the question is, um, you know, how is this achieved? What makes this work? Is it circumcision? <laughs> you know, then a whole lot of guys would probably prefer poverty. <laughs> or, or try to do it three or four times. <laughs> So, um, so happily, after, after much research and, and a great deal of uh, time invested in the studies, biblical studies that I do, I was able to, to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt, uh, you know, that it's, it's not intelligence. The truth is super high intelligence is a drawback. You know, when people say he's too smart uh... and good, that's what they mean. The fact is Sam Walton, who started Walmart, Typical, you know, just an ordinary guy. Super high IQ people end up on the faculties of universities. And I don't know if you've got any clients who are academics, Matt, but I do. And, and nobody is worse at managing money than academics. Really? No. Wow. So, Check that. Um, uh, so, you know, it's, 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 not, it's not IQ. It's not uh, circumcision. It's not chicken soup. Uh, it's nothing other than the fact that uh, embedded in the ancient Jewish wisdom of the Hebrew text of uh, Old Testament scripture are several hundred tips, tools, and techniques on making money. Yeah. Let, you know, let's, you know, it's, it's funny that you mentioned that, but it might be, you know, shrugged upon by your fellow brothers and sisters of the cloth. But everybody knows, uh, the knows of the Jewish community, Everybody knows that most Jewish people are very good with money. It's a stere stereotypes are funny sometimes because oftentimes they're true. Yeah, um, as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a person who found a faith when I got into the military and that the, the doubled down on that faith after he turned 30 years old, uh, because of a portion of the time there, I, I wasn't a believer. I wasn't following a faith. I was just trying to be a good person. Um, and, and when I got involved in the financial services industry, and I started learning about money. You know, I realized, Rabbi, I started learning more from people who are either Mormon or Jewish. You know, because Mormons got a lot of kids, you know, and they've got to find a way by default to be more entrepreneurial uh, than most other faiths, in my opinion. And then amongst the Jewish friends, here's what I realized about the Jewish friends. And, and my first office was in Skokie, Illinois. I don't know if you know much about Ch the Chicagoland area, but Skokie, Illinois. Uh, very, very Jewish neighborhood. Correct. My, first, my, my cell phone today is 847 area code because I didn't want to pay to check my cell phone voicemail back to Chicago toll call. Uh, you know, you know, so that's why I chose my 847 area code because my first office is in Skokie, Illinois. It was a Jewish community. Very, but, however, very tight yes. community uh, to do business in. But one thing I realized about uh, 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 Jewish brothers and sisters is that they, and cousins, they, uh, and I say that from a spiritual standpoint, is that they do business with each other. 
I, I, I'll give you an example. I was having such a hard time, Rabbi uh, Lappin, when I started my business. None of my friends and family wanted to listen to me, do business with me, uh, send me referrals. And then my friend who took me to a, um, it was a Passover. He took me to a Passover, right? And what's that, what's that service? Uh, uh, Seder. Seder, correct. So I came in, I had to wear I had the, the yarmulke and, and I'm talking about the Seder and I was just listening to the reading and, and, and whatnot. And uh, afterwards, I, and he, used to, he mentioned to the fact, I just started a personal fitness company here downtown Chicago. I'm like, oh yeah, watch everybody turn them down. Oh really? Have it, give me your cards, let me pass them around. I'm like, what? Everybody's supporting you in business? So you talk about specialization in your book. What is it about the tribes? Can, can you unpack the tribes of, 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 of Israel? How, how that happened in the areas of specialization that they did? Um, yeah, so it's, it's two things, Madden. Let's go back to your comment about the members of the LDS Church, who also do very well. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's because they need money because they have numbers of kids. I mean, I think you could tap 10 people on the shoulder on any street in America and say, do you need money? And they'd all say yes, you know. Okay. Uh, everybody needs money. Um, I, I think it's something else, and, and that is that... Uh, in Genesis chapter, and you'll pardon me, I'm, I'm going to quote the, the actual verse sure. because um, that's where my information comes from. Okay? Sure. This, this, uh, I, my books have transformed the lives of tens of thousands, no, hundreds of thousands of people now. Uh, I, love, I love getting testimonies by email. I get them all the time. I read them, every single one of them. Uh, people who followed the uh, guidance of my two books and my um, my uh, online programs and have changed their financial destiny substantially and significantly. Um, it's, um, uh, it's not because I'm clever. I didn't give information that I figured out by myself. No, this is all information straight out of Scripture. And so chapter 2, verse 18, is where uh, uh, the Lord says, uh, it's not good for man to be alone. Yeah. Now, a lot of people think this is talking specifically about Adam and his matrimonial prospects. But you'll notice that uh, the next verse does not say, oh, and God put uh, Adam to sleep and extracted Eve and presented him and said, hey, you know, Adam, take a look at this uh, hot woman here. (laughs) You know, this is your life now. And no, that's not what happened. Something else happened. Something about animals takes place because the verse, not good for man to be alone, does not refer exclusively to Adam. It's a general statement for all men in every place and in every time. And that is that if you are lonely, if you are isolated, if you are disconnected from other people, you will go hungry, period. Hmm. And that's why it is that um, the, uh, the most reliable uh, indicator of financial success is, and again, I mean, this, this shows up in many, many books, including The Tipping Point by... Um, uh, what's it? I forget. Oh, right, right. I know that book you talk. White, white cover. Um, the tipping, uh, the tipping point. Um, Mal- 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 uh, Malcolm Gladwell. Malcolm Gladwell. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah. Um, so he points it out, but many people point out it's quite a well-known thing, and that is that your financial success is directly proportional to the number of friends you have, the people who know you, like you, and trust you. Yeah. Now, this is not Facebook friends. Because Facebook friends is zero, means absolutely nothing. You know, I'll happily exchange 5,000 Facebook friends for one customer. <laughs> exactly. You know, it's, it's, it's rubbish. But real friends, people who return your call in 24 hours, um, people you can talk to. Now, the, the truth is most of us don't have as many of, us, of those as we'd like to think. And, uh, you know, if I had to guess on average, most, most people – watching us now, you know, probably don't have more than about 30. It's not, you know, like, oh, I've got hundreds of friends. Uh Uh-uh. It's not actually true. You don't. By the time you actually sit down to figure it out and count them out, which is an exercise everyone should do, 
So the point is that um, the good Lord wants us to be connected with one another and not isolated from one another. And so uh, one of the things about the LDS church, and it's also true of the Jewish community, is we're kind of well connected to each other. We see each other regularly. We meet up with each other. Uh, we give, uh, um, you know, we, we say, no, I'm sorry. I wish I could help you. I can't, but I'll tell you who can. I'll give you the phone number of two people who are in that area. We do that all the time. And so um, uh, I, in, in my teachings, whether it's in church on Sunday mornings or in uh, business programs and seminars, it's always to increase, actively increase, the number of people who know you, like you, and trust you. And so uh, that's number one. And number two is, and it's connected to it, is directly related to the question as you phrased it, uh, which is the question of specialization. Now, um, uh, here, here is uh, an example of, of how to do it. Look, we all like it. Um, you, you just have one child at the moment. Uh, uh, uh... Under two. <laughs> we have, I have five total. 25 years old, 19-year-old twins, a 10-year-old, oh, well, and a two-year-old. Okay. Fabulous. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Uh, so which one's the Lamborghini driver? Uh, oh, yes, that's, that, would be, that would be Jordan, which, of course, Ivan cut that video. So uh, that was his tryout video to get a job. <laughs> that's the two-year-old. That's the two-year-old right now, correct. Good. Okay, well, it's good he's starting young. <laughs> Thank um, you. So... Yeah. Um, but in the same way that we like it when we see our children getting on with each other and loving each other, we don't like to see them squabbling with each other. Right. In the same way, our Father in Heaven also wants to see us connecting with each other and helping, with the, helping each other. Amen. So um, when uh, two of our daughters, they wanted to, in, they were homeschooled, but they wanted to try out what a school would be like. Mm -hmm. So they went off to, we sent them off to a, a boarding school in Colorado. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then um, this was, you know, they, they didn't have access to email or anything. It was just regular letters. And mm -hmm. my wife, Susan would write each of them a letter with an alternate word on the separate really? sheet of paper. So each girl got a letter, which was gobbledygook. You could make no sense of it unless you'd meet up with your sister at lunchtime or whatever. You both take out your letters and now you, you read them together. And so uh, each girl ultimately wow. reads one word and then the whole letter makes sense. And we did this because we wanted to make sure they spend time together with each other. Okay, so, so that's how that works. The great thing about specialization is it makes us need one another. And, uh, you know, I think back to uh, when Samuel Colt started his uh, uh, revolver manufacturing um, firm in Connecticut in the uh, 1800s. And mm -hmm. what was so interesting here is what happened was he used to have six guys sitting around a big table and uh, against the wall around the walls of the room, you know, there was a blank stock for barrels, blank stock for, uh, for, uh, um, uh, uh, for um, uh, trigger assemblies and, and okay. just, all, yeah. and then each guy would go and, and he'd take a piece of uh, steel and he'd go to the drill press and drill out the barrel. And then he'd, um, he'd put the, um, uh, the, uh, he, he'd assemble it. Uh, with um, uh, the, the various other components. And then when it was finished, he'd put his initials on the back of the handle and put it in a basket. And at the end of the day, Samuel Colt would gather up all the revolvers and he'd pay each man according to the number of revolvers that he made. That's right. how it worked. Oh, interesting. Um, but then uh, Samuel Colt discovered the secret of specialization. Partially what happened, he didn't learn it from the Bible. He learned it from Adam Smith, who had written a book in 1776 that spoke about specialization. And just look and see, you know, with, with me here for a moment, Matt, what happened to Samuel Colt. He says to the six guys, hey guys, we're gonna have a change around here. You're not gonna like it at first, but I think it's gonna work out better for everybody. He says, uh, you, Adam, you're gonna make just barrels. 
and uh, um, Brad, you're just going to make cartridges and uh, the uh, the um, the revolver. And Charlie, you're going to make the handle. And David, you're going to make the the trigger. And uh, and Edward, you're going to make the uh, the sights. And Frederick, you're going to assemble all the parts. And and nobody's going to put their initials on because you all built it together. Well. They didn't like it at first, but they discovered a very strange thing, and that is that they were making more than twice as many revolvers every day than, the, than they used to. Interesting. So every man is getting double pay. Now, why would God care? Like, God is saying to you, specialize, and I'll show you where in the Bible in a moment. God's saying, specialize, and I'll reward you with the incredible blessing of financial abundance. Well, why would God care? And the reason is because in the old system, Matt, the old system that Sam used to work at, let's say that Charlie didn't show up for work one day. What's the reaction of uh, Adam and, and, and Brad and, and David and Edward and Frederick? They couldn't care less, right? Yeah, yeah. Just means there's more sandwiches and, bre and, and, sa and beer for them at lunchtime. Sure. <laughs> but in the second system, what happens when uh, Charlie doesn't show up for work one day? Production stops. Production doesn't even start. It's just not there. It stops, right? Mm -hmm. So everybody runs over to Charlie's house and they say, hey, Charlie, what's the matter? Are you okay? And Charlie says, hey, you know, my kid's sick and I had to help my wife take care of the cows before I could leave for work. The guys say, well, quickly show us what to do. We'll help you. We want to get you back to the workshop as quickly as possible. And they help him and they get everything fixed up and they bring him back to the workshop and they get to work. In other words... We only care for one another because of specialization. Wow. If, if, if I could take care of all my needs, I wouldn't be in the slightest bit interested in the welfare of the Allen Edmonds Shoe Company because I make my own shoes. Who cares about anyone else? Sure. But since I, I live in my world of specialization, Allen Edmonds makes shoes that I can stand comfortably in when I give a lecture for two and a half hours. So I want them to stay in business. I, yep. I, I care about them. Yep. And so it is. Um, my wow. favorite restaurant, I want to make sure they do well. And the waiter who takes care, I want everybody to do well because otherwise they will not be able to continue serving me. So that's why it was that um, at the end of Genesis, Jacob is about to die and he calls his sons together. And uh, he spends 30 verses giving each of the sons a different kind of blessing. If it was me writing this book, I'd have had Jacob say, boys, you know what? You've all been a hell of a pain of a neck, pain in the neck for the last years. And you know what? God bless you all. I'm out of here. I'm going home to the Lord. Goodbye. I'm gone. <laughs> right. One verse. And instead of which we read, he gives a blessing to Reuben, he gives a blessing to Levi, he gives a blessing to Simon, gives a blessing to Judah, because he's setting them up for specialization. He's making them need one another. Wow. Each one is going to have a different specialty. And again, at the end of Deuteronomy, exactly the same thing. Uh, Moses on his deathbed, and uh, he calls all the tribes of Israel. And again, if it was me, I'd say, you know, man, the last 40 years through the desert has been sheer hell. I'm really, I'm, I, I've had it with you all up to here. You've all been a gigantic pain in the you know what. I'm out of here. God bless you all. Yep. And instead, again, it's another 30 verses. Every tribe gets its own blessing. Wow. Wow. To emphasize this idea that the best way to build connection is through specialization. Mm -hmm. Anybody, anyone who does their own taxes is making a big mistake. There are people who know how to do that better than you do. Use your time to do what you can do best and build a relationship with an accountant who will take care of your taxes for you. That's what you need to do. Correct. And so that's the, the secret that uh, we've been talking about. And you, you said that on the uh, 700 Club uh, interview, that you'll never find a Jewish man changing his own oil or mowing his own lawn, right? It's crazy, yeah. yeah. I mean, why would you do it when you can use your time productively? But But... In the communities I was raised in, African-American community, Latino community, Filipino community, they say, oh, but I'd save 20 bucks just doing it myself. Yeah. Which is a departure from... Right. I, I, if I did it myself, I'd save 20 bucks. And if instead I hired the kid down the street to do it for me for 20 bucks or 25 or 30 bucks, if I want to be lavish, uh, and then I use the time to finish drawing up the business plan I'm working on for a client, 
and when that finishes and I, I get paid $6,000, it, it was kind of a good deal not to take care of my own lawn. That's correct. That's correct. And, and, and also, you also mentioned, too, one time you hired a babysitter. And after she got up, she goes, oh, you know, she cooked around. What do, you, what do I owe you for a couple hours of babysitting? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. So she was not confident of what her time was worth. She goes, eight bucks? She said, no, 12 bucks, because I want you to be happy receiving the 12 bucks. I want to be able to call you again. Right. For you to come back. And that, and that comes from people's misunderstanding of money. People assume money is material and not spiritual. So <laughs> they assume that if they take your money, you have less of it. Wow. And wow. so that's one of the reasons many people, and I'm sure you've met people like this as well, who are uncomfortable naming their price. Correct. Because yes. they feel that there's something... Uh, something slightly venal about getting paid because they're taking your money, leaving you with less money. Mm -hmm. I, I want to go back, Rabbi, with um, to the money conversation about Jews being disproportionately good. I, I, is there, if you were to wrap down some of the best habits of what Jews do to be proportionally do well with money. What would you say those? Uh, what would you say those best habits or best practices would be? I, and I, I caught a couple of them, which is regularly meeting together. Uh, they actively increase uh, those that know you and trust you. What would you? What would you add to this list? Well, there's another thirty-eight. <laughs> Woo! And you'll okay. find them all in the table of contents of business secrets from the Bible. Gotcha. I, I, we 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 uh, we got we got so these oh, basically have right because, because yeah. Let me, let me explain something. Okay. If, uh, if United Airlines goes to, to, or Southwest Airlines buys Boeing airplanes, they go to Boeing and they put in an order for uh, 50 new 737s. And they say, by the way, what is your success rate? Like typically how many of your airplane, what percentage of your airplanes fly and stay flying? And Boeing says, yeah, you know, on a good day, we count on about 95% of our planes work. Right? They're, Okay. That's ridiculous. Nobody would say that. Yeah, right, right, right. The answer is 100%. <laughs> they all do. I mean, yeah. you know, short of tragedy or pilot error, things happen. But planes, it's not 98% of them fly. All of them fly. Yeah. Um, you know, what bridge? You, you, you go about to build a bridge. Bridge, huge, complex structure with cables and plating and ten. It's big. What percentage of bridges stand? Well, other than the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, which you'll hear about when you set up in Tacoma, um, which was an unusual case in 1941, I think. They shut it off, right? They, they, they shut that off? Or... It, yeah. it, it, fell, it, it fell, but uh, yeah. <laughs> other than that, 100% uh, of bridges stand. Right, correct. You know, uh, other than the Titanic, what percentage of ships that are built float? Yeah. All of them. Yeah. All of them. What percentage of marriages work? Ooh, Hundred percent? Correct. No, of course not. Not even close. Yeah. How about business startups? How what percentage of them? 95 percent fail rate in the first three years. Fail rate is very very high. In fact, the marriage rate and the business success rate is kind of about the same. So why is it? it? Everyone thinks they know how to be married. Everyone thinks they know how to start a business, but the success rate is maybe sixty percent. And yet uh, nobody thinks they're now to build a bridge or build a plane, and yet the success rate is 100%. Mm -hmm. um, it's, um, it's, it's really important to understand that on physical matters, it's, physical matters are really easy. Mm -hmm. Things that are measurable in a lab or in an engineering workshop, very, very easy to do. Um, mm -hmm. And... And, you know, and again, I mean, uh, you, you, you got a, a gun and you want to work out the trajectory. Uh, what is the angle of elevation if you want it, if you want the, the shell or the... Um, yeah. uh, you're, you're, you're round, you're round, round on target. You want it to, to land in a certain place. This is not hard to do. Correct. Not hard to do. Because when you're dealing with physical characteristics, uh, these things are all very easy. But as soon as you are dealing with what I call spiritual characteristics, and Matt, can I take 30 seconds here to talk about definition? Because it's really important. Please, please, please. please. Everybody gets clear yeah. definitions here. Um, spiritual has nothing to do with me being a rabbi. Spiritual has nothing to do with God. Spiritual has nothing to do with religion. Spiritual has nothing to do with piety or virtue or sin. 
a spiritual just means something I cannot measure in a laboratory. Hmm. And so I, I can measure uh, the skin color of a person. I can measure the height of a person. I can measure the weight of the person. And the truth is that every one of those things are irrelevant. If I'm hiring somebody, <laughs> I really don't care about any of those things. The things I care about are integrity, optimism, willpower, yeah. resilience. Yep. Those things are not measurable. So, R Rabbi, this blows my mind away because I talk to a lot of men and we encourage them to get in business for themselves. And next thing you know, to build a business, you got to get that. You got to go out there and know people. You got to increase those that know you and trust you. And next thing you know, a lot of men, they say, you know what? I'd just rather work with my hands, you know, because I, now I get it because it's so easy to deal with wrenches and it's engines. It's, it's, it's easy. Look, uh, whether, whether, whether you're a, uh, an auto mechanic or whether you are a surgeon, uh, it's just, uh, you, you're just working with different tools and, you know, the stakes are a little bit higher with the surgery, but it's basically, <laughs> it's basically all physical. Yeah. It, you're taking tools and you're fixing some pipes or tubes that don't work the way they ought to, the hydraulic system or the, uh, the blood, whatever it is, that's all physical. But why is it that there are some auto mechanics or plumbers who make a fortune and others barely make a living? There are surgeons, believe it or not, there are surgeons who struggle, who are not making a lot of money, and there are others who are making a huge amount of money. And the answer is that uh, the ones who are succeeding, whether they are surgeons or mechanics, are the ones who understand the spiritual qualities as well. Uh, they learn how to market. They learn how to sell. Yes, it's true. If, if you want to work with your hands, that's great. Be a mechanic. But build up the business. Hire more people to work for you. Develop the marketing. Make Make, make sure there's always a line of people trying to get you to take care of their cause. Now, that part is the spiritual part. Wow. That is profound. That's because that requires then, which one of your habits talks about increasing your self-discipline, integrity, and character strength in achieving success, which is habit or secret number 11. Yeah, exactly right. There you go. Okay. Can I ask you then, um, then this? Money's so spiritual then. Does, Sorry, the, no. If money's I, so spiritual, does, does God, yeah. would God, does God really want us to be rich? No. If okay. he does, if he does, he hasn't shared that information with me. <laughs> okay. Okay. It's a little bit like, um, does God want us to have great sex? Um, uh, I, think so because he I'll save you I'll save you. <laughs> yes. um again unfortunately the Lord has not shared that with me <laughs> I live in hope but um what I do know is that the Lord does want um one man and one woman to be utterly devoted to one another until they become like a unified entity and it shouldn't surprise us that a good and, and loving God should reward that behavior with the greatest sensual pleasure known to human beings, which is sex. Correct. Does he want us to be rich? Unfortunately, he hasn't shared that with me, although I live in hope. But I do know that above all, he wants us to be obsessively preoccupied with taking care of one, an one another's needs and desires. And it should not surprise now, if you want to be cynical, you can call that market research, you can call it marketing, you can call it selling. But if you are obsessively preoccupied with taking care of other people's needs, why would it surprise you that a good and loving God would reward you with the incredible blessing of financial abundance? Wow. Wow. Uh, and that's why the way, by the way, that we Jews never pray to God, oh, please, God, help me find $600 that I can make the rent payment next week. Okay. We never say that. Okay. We always say, please, God, open my eyes so that I can see more of your children that need my services. The money will follow by itself. Amen. Look at that. Um, which was one of my questions, you know, in terms of today's technology, open access to information, 
capitalistic type of economy in America, how would you advise somebody to get rich? You just answered it. Um, so with that being said, is there a, what, where is the line between ambition and greed? And how would you define, because, you know, you see Wall Street, you know, the movie, greed is good. You know, go, oh, you know. that's, go that's nonsense. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. No, there is no time that a, uh, a vice becomes a virtue, unless, unless you are going to distort 2,000 years of Judeo-Christian thinking. That's complete rubbish. Uh, okay. Uh, no, gr greed is never good. But then uh, one of the uh, uh, habits of building a successful business and generating increased revenue um, is to start giving away 10% of your income. Now, there are a lot of reasons for that. Again, though, not that what I talk about here has nothing to do with, uh, uh, you know, God wants you to take care of the poor, nothing to do with that. Strictly from the point of view of generating revenue, being a giver is really good. Well, you, you answer the question yourself because part of being a giver is that you can never become a greedy person. You are always a giver as well. And so being a giver does a, many, many wonderful things for you. But one of the best is that it banishes the possibility of uh, becoming greedy. Interesting. And so trying to increase revenue, there, there's never a point at which that is greed. Okay. Okay. Because I'm not trying to increase revenue. I'm trying to find better ways to serve God's other children. That's right. That's right. Now, the, the added money follows after that, and, uh, and, and that's a wonderful and that's a good thing. But there's, there's no point at which somebody should say, uh, well, as soon as I'm making 100 grand, that's going to be enough for me. Because number one, you're lying, it won't. And number two, uh, it shouldn't be. And here is the one area where you and I might, I think this is literally maybe the only area we disagree. And that is that um, uh, retirement to me is a terrible thing. I agree with you on that one. No, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I agree. I, and what here's what you're here, talking about is not retiring, but the ability to retire. Cor correct, and because I've seen the first five years of my career, Rabbi, was dealing with the retirement communities, mm -hmm. and I saw what lifelessness, remote controls, doing nothing does, versus yeah. somebody actively engaged in helping provide service. Yeah, for, you're exactly, <laughs> you're exactly right. And <laughs> and here's and and here's how uh, it looks at from a scriptural point of view, Matt. Um, you know, talking about accountants, let's say I go to my accountant every uh, April the 14th. Hey, here's all my shoebox full of papers. Uh, time to do taxes. Comes April the 14th a week ago, and I go to him and uh, guess what? He says, oh, I'm sorry, I won't be helping you. I said, excuse me? He says, haven't you heard? I've retired. I said, wait, I don't understand. Why are you retired? He said, well, I've made enough money. I don't need any more. I'm off to play golf. <laughs> I say, the hell you are. <laughs> what about me? Don't you care about me? And his answer is, if I did, I wouldn't retire. Obviously, I don't care about you. Wow. And if you don't care about other people, why should God care about you? As a matter of fact, why should God even need you around? <laughs> That's why, unfortunately, God forbid, I hate this, but uh, people who retire deteriorate in health. Because basically, <laughs> I think God is saying to them, well, great, you've given up taking care of my other children, so goodbye. Who needs you? Yeah, Rabbi, when my, my father was laid off at 58 years old, and I just, so I simultaneously got out of the military, started my business. My dad simultaneously got laid off. Ah, terrible, and, terrible and, thing. And I saw him for a period of years not be able to get a job. Terrible. And my mother's a nurse. I'm Filipino, right? So that means my mom's a nurse. So she's a nurse, she's a nurse, but she's effectively, you know, with, with the financial resource that dad's able to provide. But I did see a deterioration in my dad's mind, his sharpness, yes, his wit, I, his engagement. Absolutely, it's tragic. Absolutely tragic, yeah. yes. Um, uh, you know, when, when we're, we're looking at, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, did, did you were finishing your thought? No, I'm just saying, yeah. I'm, I'm so happy we agree on him. <laughs> Amen on that. Uh, also, although contrarian you know, viewpoints are always very helpful too as well. Um, when I look at the parable of the talents, Matthew 25, you know, when the master left, and there's a video I've done, which is, you know, the, the, the Bible story that made me millions, which is a controversial topic in itself. But, um, but I just looked at that as a parable of the talents because when the master is leaving, he's giving talents according to the, to the servants, according to their ability. And the question I've always asked myself, Rabbi, after reading that parable, 
is am I a one talent servant? Am I a two talent servant? Am I a four talent servant? What is my ability? And that's my prayer is how do I make sure I'm always the servant that's increasing his ability, increasing his talent. But with that being said, it, I mean, is God, it, 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 in your understanding, is God somebody that will never want to see the poor? Because it, when I read the Bible and I see all these different things, why is there such large income inequality today? Uh, or, or, or the illusion of it. Yeah. Um, so uh, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 15 has two verses, um, uh, only a few verses apart. One of them says that um, uh, you must always give the poor because um, uh, they'll always be around. Okay. And wow. The other one in, the, in chapter 15 of Deuteronomy says uh, basically that if you follow the edicts of, uh, of, of the Lord, there will be no poor among you. Well, you can't have it both ways. Either there'll be no poor or there'll always be poor, but make up your mind. Okay. And ancient Jewish wisdom explains these two verses in Deuteronomy 15 um, very simply, saying, look, uh, if you, if you um, follow these systems and principles and these timeless truths, you will never be poor. You've got nothing to worry about. But always know that if you look over one shoulder, you'll see people with more than you. And if you look over the other shoulder, you'll see people with less than you. That's a reality. Because God created people very differently from animals. And that is the, uh, the whole lesson of Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2, which is that people and animals are completely different. The fact is that um, if a zookeeper um, is, you know, time to feed the elephants, he, he gives every elephant of the same size the same amount of food because equality works with animals. <laughs> uh, farmers feeding the cows, all the cows get the same amount of food roughly. Sure. But you can't do that with people. Why is that? Because God decided to give us something more important than equality, and that's freedom. And when you have freedom, you have freedom to excel, and you have freedom to goof off and do nothing. Wow. And the only deal God made with us is it's your life. You can do what you like. The only thing you have to know is you have to live with the consequences. I'm hmm. not going to bail you out. <laughs> There it is. And so, um, uh, you know, I know this is sort of politically incorrect because it sort of sounds as if I'm blaming the victim. But uh, today, uh, poverty is not um, the result of anything external that anybody is doing to anybody else. It's a result of bad habits, bad behavior, and bad culture. That's all. So when they pour $4 trillion into the economy... When 40% of all wealth, 40% of all money is printed in the United States of America was created in the last 12 months because of COVID. And they're pouring all this money to help lift up the bottom. Your not thoughts gonna, on it? Yeah. I'm not going to do it. It's not going to do it. going to do it. Uh, you want to, you know, you take a, a poor guy, a guy who's got no money, you want to you help him. I would say to him, don't take my money. That's not going to help you. Take my values. Ooh. Okay. I can, and I'll tell you what to do. Um, first of all, you've got to learn the, the soft skills. You've got to be able to be subservient. You've got to stop making your machoism uh, your most important characteristic. You've got to be able to learn how to serve a boss, an employer, or a customer. And that's not easy. It goes against everything you've been acculturated with since you were a child. And then you're going to have to learn a skill. Then you're going to have to learn to show up, not at 8 o'clock on Monday morning, but at 10 minutes to 8 Monday morning. And you're going to stay not till 5 o'clock, but till 10 past 5. And you're going to do more than is expected of you. And number two, do not have children before you're married. Number three, make sure you learn how to talk Speak whatever language, whatever country you're in, speak that language. Do not speak a bastardized version of it. Huh. 
because otherwise you can't communicate effectively. You turn people off. All you've got to do is these things, and I promise you, you're on the financial escalator. Now, it's not they're not going to be easy, but that's all that's going to put you on the financial escalator. And it's not the immediate result that people are looking for today. That's correct, yes. I mean, great, yes. I mean, you want an immediate result, there's probably nothing quicker than robbing a convenience store. That's right. Gosh. Um, I am enamored by King Solomon. Yes. I'm enamored by Proverbs. Ecclesiastes, I'm enamored by him. Outside of what I read in Proverbs, from your studies, what, what set King Solomon apart from, from other kings, outside of him asking for wisdom, unless that's it, I mean, but what really set, because he was young, he was, what, 13, 14 years old when he took over and he asked for, for wisdom. What, right. what really set King Solomon apart from all the different kings? Um, so I'll, I'll answer that, but I just want to jump back to something else because I realized that I did not answer an earlier question okay. uh, that that you asked. And um, and that was, oh my goodness, this is complicated. Um, oh, I, I know what it was. You you asked me um, what are the you know the top three or four behaviors or, or habits that would work that are important. And I answered by saying, well, there's those three that you mentioned plus another 37 in, in the book for a total of 40. And then I, I, I sort of carried on and I lost myself, but I started talking okay. about the complexity okay. that uh, unlike buildings and boats and bridges, uh, marriages and businesses are, uh, they have spiritual involvement, which makes them incredibly complicated. And because they're incredibly complicated, there is no such thing as what is the one most important thing. People ask me all the time. So in terms of uh, making my marriage a success or fixing my marriage, could you tell me what the one most important thing? No, I can't. I see. Yeah. Um, because number one, I don't know enough about you. So the uh, what's important for you may not be important for somebody else. Number two, uh, it's so complex that it's extremely unlikely that there is only one thing. Uh, there's probably at least five things you're doing wrong and you need to start doing right. And uh, similarly, when it comes to, to business, I mean, just in the short time you and I have had the pleasure of talking to each other, we've covered so many different aspects already. <laughs> And so, yeah, I wish I could spend more time with you. I, I just, I, I'm just so, I'm just soaking it all in. But right, but you're with me on this, right? That, yeah. that to to be able to say to a stranger, I don't even know your business. I don't know how what goes. I don't know what you like. Right. I can't give you the one most important thing. I don't have the Correct. faintest idea what it what it is. Correct. Um, I can tell you 40 important things, and then you can figure out for yourself which order you should tackle them in. Correct. I can I can do that. But um, but so it is also that uh, with with the, with with King Solomon, who's so outside the range of our normal experience. I mean, you know, this is not you know like the guy I sit next to on the train in the morning. You're right. Correct. So uh, yeah. um, so uh, you know, um, I, I I think that one of the, uh, the one of the best ways I can answer your good question is by saying that um, if uh, you know, if if I like um, uh, a musician, you know, let's say let's say I'm into John Lennon, mm -hmm. um, and I'm thinking, about, oh, man, he's dead. I wish I could meet him. I wish I could get to know him. I I wish I could go to dinner with him. Well, none of that's going to happen. Sure. So what's the next best thing? If I really want to get to into the, I want to get into the soul of John Lennon. Best thing is to listen to his creation, get to know his work. Yep. Right. Correct. Get to know his work. And, um, and this is one of the reasons that uh, the appeal of getting to know God is so incredible, right? Because you want to get to know God, and that's really nice. The trouble is it's, it's kind of hard. But here's the best thing. Get to know his creation. Oh, wow. And you, 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 you get to enjoy the world, and you look at the world he created, and you study it and understand it. Uh, and and it becomes very exciting. In fact, the most exciting thing of all is to get to know the most exciting creation of God, which is another human being. And that's why one of the euphemisms in the Bible for sex is get to know, he knew her. And that's what it's talking about. Because part of the reason that sex is irresistible is because it touches on the infinite. In a, in a little bit of a way, it gives you a subconscious sense of what getting to know God would be like because you're getting to know his creation, another human being. So, 
uh, getting to know Sol uh, King Solomon, I, I take the same approach as you do, which is, you know, I, I read Ecclesiastes, I read Proverbs uh, repeatedly, and there's never a single time I read it where I don't have a new discovery. Still, wow. Because when, 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 the reason why I ask that is because in this crazy era, I, I'm sadly, I, I, you know, I'm just very transparent with not only yourself, but my pastors, my, my audience, my company. I share that I repay the mistakes of my 20s throughout my entire 30s yes, because, because I didn't pay attention to these spiritual truths. I got married. I got divorced. I had kids out of marriage. Yeah. And, I, yeah. and I paid a price for it. I paid of a whole course. Okay. Of course. You can do what you like, he says. You just have to pay the consequences. <laughs> That's right. And once I got married under the right context, my life had absolutely, has absolutely, my 40s now, phew, just, it's just like this, you know? And so I find it ironic, however, when Solomon talks about the Proverbs 31, uh, virtues of a wife, Proverbs 31, yeah. but yet he had thousands of kids, thousands of concubines. I mean, can you explain that? Well, I mean, for, yeah. for the modern man saying, well, you know, King Solomon had all these wives and girlfriends and side, side, side pieces, what's up? Yeah, um, so here's where having a rabbi helps. Okay. <laughs> You know, you asked me about, like, I like to say everyone needs a rabbi. Here we go. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is it. <laughs> um, because there's, there's no way this is evident from the English translation of Proverbs 31. But um, going back to Genesis, Abraham, uh, our founder, our founding father, father yes. Abraham's wife, Sarah, dies. And uh, the verse in Genesis tells us, um, that he uh, mourned her and he um, he eulogized her. And so, uh, Proverbs 31 is actually uh, Solomon putting down in writing what had been known just by heart up till then, which was Abraham's famous eulogy for his wife. Really? Mm, in the same way that many, many school kids, particularly homeschool kids, can recite uh, the Gettysburg Address of Abraham Lincoln. And, and he, even though that that was like a hundred, more than 150 years ago, people still know it. Well, for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, people knew the famous eulogy that Abraham said for his wife, Sarah. And Solomon finally wrote it down. It's chapter 31. Unbelievable. That's yeah. really not him. It's really, so, it's really it's, it's Abraham. Solomon. It's Abraham. Yes. So how does one, so Rabbi Lappin, to make sure we get this right, because I see this as a major area of financial curses that happen in people's life when they choose the wrong partner. They yeah, choose the wrong yeah. wife. Yeah. How do we go about choosing a right life partner, wife, mother, your child, father, your child? Fantastic, fantastic point. And I, I love talking about this on my podcast quite often um, because it keeps on, on coming up. But this is something that I, 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 I even though it's challenging to answer in, in just uh, one instance, because again, there's there's uh, layers upon layers, but I, it's important enough that we should we should address it for our audience. And um, it, this isn't going to be easy to hear. Okay. But um, and I certainly I specifically address this to young women, but I also address it to young men. Uh, I did a show about the ten most important years in a man's life, and I know you'll relate to this because of your. Um, your your uh, um, frightening self honesty and self awareness. <laughs> um, but the most important ten years in a man's life are from the age of thirteen to twenty three. Wow! Because if you if you get them all right, then everything after that will be fine. Unbelievable. Um, so, uh, and again, obviously, the most the most common letter I get from people again and again is, you know, thank you for that teaching of ancient Jewish wisdom. Where were you when I was twenty? Correct. Yeah, and yeah. and I, I totally understand that. You, yes, we make mistakes, and um, choosing the wrong spouse is right up there. Now, <laughs> uh, it's not unrecoverable. Let's say you chose the wrong spouse. It's, it's, it's a battle, but you can still get it right. It's much easier to choose the right one to begin with. How do you do it? Okay. Uh, number one, um, you try and remove love from your vocabulary. Wow. Your heart. Now, that doesn't mean I lack sentiment. It doesn't sure. mean I 
I, it doesn't mean I don't love my woman. Um, I, I don't, it, that's not what it means. But right, what it right, does right. mean is that nine times out of 10, when you say love, you actually mean lust, if you're honest about it. Oh, of course, yeah, it's a sex, yeah. And, and so when, you know, when I say I love roast turkey, <laughs> I mean, if that were true, if I really loved the turkey, I wouldn't eat it, I'd set it free. <laughs> when I say I love turkey, I'm saying I love how turkey makes me feel. Correct, yes. And most times when a guy says, I love you, he is talking about what getting in her pants would make him feel. Sure. That's all. Sure. So um, that's, that's an important thing. So number two, addressing myself to young women, if you marry a guy because he says he loves you, then you must fully now know that you are morally obliged to accept when he tells you he doesn't love you anymore, but he loves a girl he met at his office. If you marry because he loved you, then you have to end the marriage when he doesn't love you. It's just fair. I mean, that's the only fair way to go. And so, um, uh, how do how do we how do we deal with all this? Well, my advice, and again, hard to follow, but I I give it for what it's worth. It's worth a huge amount, and to the extent that you can follow it, I strongly recommend that a couple talks on the phone for at least four hours before they meet one another. That's right. Which means that you do not Touch. plan on marrying somebody you met in a bar. <laughs> right. Um, you, you, ask, you ask people who know you and people who you trust to set you up with someone they know. You ask relatives, you ask friends. You be if you're a single person, make sure that most of your friends are not single. Make sure you're friends with ma happily married couples. Ideally, couples who are in a marriage you would like to emulate. Ask them to introduce you to somebody and tell them you want to talk to that person on the phone before you meet them. Mm. And talk extensively so you can get to know the person before the old hormones kick in. But the problem we have today, Rabbi, is Instagram and Facebook and social media, the visual. It's a big problem because it's all visual. Yeah. It's a big problem. And then finally, and most importantly, um, you, uh, you don't date open-endedly. Uh, you date purposefully, specifically for the purpose of finding out marriage compatibility. And marriage then is, if it's not love, what is it? The answer is, it's a commitment. That's what it is. And commitments don't change. And is that the reason why the stereotype is that married couples do better because there's a natural commitment that goes on uh, versus yeah. people that are single that are in business because there's really no commitment and how you do one thing is how you do everything? Uh, and that's why it is that people who marry, this is a well-known figure, people who marry after living together get divorced much more than people who don't. Wow. Yeah, it's exactly as you say, it's the commitment thing. So commitment is huge, which, which means that the integrity of the person you marry is hugely important. I'm not saying looks don't count. Correct. They do, but sure. other things also count. And today, nobody pays attention to the other things. So it doesn't make sense to be married to somebody for three months before you discover they have no integrity. It's kind of something you should have known before. Can I do a quick speed round with you, Rabbi Lappin? Yeah, of course. Um, your top five wealthy people in the Bible, three, four, five, however, however it comes up. Oh, wealthy people in the Bible well, we should study. Um, the, Abram, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, Joseph was a great creator of wealth. He understood the need to lower taxes, is what he told uh, when he when he told uh, uh, Pharaoh to lower taxes to 20%, that is what caused the seven years of plenty. Interesting. Yeah. Who, who's, in, who's in Biden's corner these days? Because he's raising he's America. Well, that's why, you know, I, I've got to make sure my introduction stops saying advised president, because I'd hate to be blamed for anything mm -hmm. going on. I gotcha, I gotcha. Um, so, uh, uh, and and one more, one more you want. Sure. Um, uh, Abram, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. Who else would you put in there? Oh, um, uh, uh, Zebulun. 
where, where can we find us his story? Oh, um, Zebulon was, is the archetype business professional. Wow. Um, his place was on the seashore because he traded, so he needed a harbor and ships. And then his blessing from Moses in Deuteronomy, at the end of Deuteronomy, um, speaks about uh, uh, the willingness. Again, uh, this is a whole lot easier to see in the Hebrew original than in the English translation, but uh, the willingness to shatter existing models. And that's crucial for business to, to be able to constantly adapt. You don't keep building buggy whips when Henry Ford is building the Model A automobile down the road. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um, I, I, uh, I, any particular reason, I mean, I just, I just threw this out there. Any particular reason why when Jesus began his ministry, why his first recruit, why his first recruit, why he said, I'm going to build my church upon this rock. Why did he choose an entrepreneur? Why did he choose Peter? Why did he choose a fisherman? Um, I, you know, I, I, I wish I could answer it reliably, but right. it's outside my bailiwick. I'm only knowledgeable in the Old Testament, not the New Testament. I, so I just don't know that. But if you tell me that somebody of, uh, about to start an organization hires an entrepreneur's executive director, I'd say, right on guy, you know what you're doing. Is that right? That's okay. Because they, that's it. I mean, wouldn't you do it if, if you're looking for a, sure. a, a right-hand man, you're looking to hire a new person in your organization, somebody who's demonstrated an entrepreneurial skills, uh, you know, you and me, we'd both want him. And be number one, his number, first one draft pick. So, yeah. Rabbi Lapp, you're so generous with your time. You, you just blown my mind. I got notes upon notes here of, uh, uh, notes here. I've been highlighting stuff here in the Bible. He's been going through it. <laughs> you know, I, pleasure. I can't <laughs> tell you how wonderful your questions are. Um, <laughs> What makes a, an interview incredibly grueling, and I'm sure you've been on the receiving end of this every now and then as well, where the person doing the interviewing kind of started doing his homework on you about 10 minutes before the interview started. And sure. it's so exhausting. Uh, right. But right. Instead, talking to you is exhilarating. It's fun. I, I feel I'd like to continue chatting with you for another few hours and then go out for beer after that. I hope so. I hope this is not the last time we communicate or, or circle back. Uh, you've been a blessing to myself. You've been a blessing to my staff. You've been a blessing to our YouTube channel and the Seven Figure Squad for Scripture Series. So thank you so much. Any, anytime, Matt. Uh, don't hesitate. Uh, I feel very connected to you and uh, anything I can ever do to be of any help, just uh, you know how to get hold of me. 100%. Everybody, if you've been watching this, uh, appreciate uh, Rabbi Lapkin. Make sure you go to RabbiDanielLapkin.com. If you're watching this on Figs, make sure you click like, follow our business page. My name is Smart Guy. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you click subscribe and hit notification to be, uploaded, to be alerted next time we upload our next episode. Let me know your thoughts, your comments, your questions, your biggest takeaways from Rabbi Daniel Lapin. That being said, thank you, Rabbi Lapin, for your time. Great being with you. Until we meet again, continue to live smart, continue to love smart, and be money smart today. Bye-bye.